Well, good evening. Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanks very much for spending some time with us tonight. Great to see you on the channel. And uh, we've got a few more people saying, mention me, mention me, uh, Tom, uh, David, <laughs> Theta One, <laughs> Ken Tan. Look, I could go down the whole list and spend the whole show just uh, calling out names. So I'm going to stop, stop there for the moment. But anyway, great to have you all on, on board. This is a really important conversation, uh, not least because of the, uh, the tie up that I now have with Nucleus Wealth, but because there is a really critical set of questions around financial management and investing at the moment, particularly, of course, with low interest rates and particularly with uh, all of the other questions going on in terms of the economy and the virus and all those things. So we've got some really good people here tonight from Nucleus Wealth to help us think about some of these issues. Um, as normal, I'm just going to uh, remind everybody that this isn't financial advice. Uh, and if you um, Please play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. It's being moderated as normal. Um, this is as at the 17th of November 2020. Use that Walk the World to get my attention because there's always a lot of stuff going on on the channel. And I've enabled Super Chat um, so that you can put your question right to the top if you want to ask a question, make sure it gets seen. But also if you want to make a donation. And Ron, thanks very much for your donation already. Really appreciate it. So with that introduction, let me uh, push a couple of buttons and uh, see whether I can do it better than I did last week. You may remember I had Chris on last week and I got him to picture to come on but forgot the sound. So I'm going to try and make sure we get both. So we'll go, we'll go there and we'll go there. Right. So let's see. Damien. Oh, no, that's um, Tim. Hi, Tim. Hi, Martin. How are you going? Yeah, great. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. You all right? I'm very well, thank you. Yes, we've spent a lot of time on white balance. I still don't think it's quite there yet, but uh, we'll have to take it for uh, what it is. Believe, believe me, it's better, better than it was. Um, and uh, Damien, are you there? Hi, Martin. How are you going? Yay, it's working. Eureka. Okay, great to have you both uh, on the show. Now, I thought what we should do just to start with is, um, you know, one of the things I want to sort of stress to people is that uh, Nucleus Wealth is, uh, you know, an entity with real people who are actually involved in making real decisions about uh, what's going on. So maybe just a bit of introduction for, you, for both of you would be a good place to start. Uh, Damon, do you just want to give you a sort of, a, the, you know, the 30 second pen picture, picture first? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, about the product side, is it about you? About you? About me? Okay, yeah. So, look, I've come from um, been in broking for uh, twenty five plus years. Uh, as, a, as a stockbroker, um, I worked in. Uh, I helped founded uh, Australia's one of Australia's biggest independent research house, uh, Aegis Equities Research, and uh, ran that. And it was head of research there for for um, about seven or eight years. Uh, I've worked in tactical asset allocation for uh, stockbrokers, and then I, I spent the last couple of years before starting Nucleus um, in the, the global quantitative team at, at Schroders, um, which was managing about 60 billion Australian dollars at the time. So, um, yeah, so, so long history in terms of uh, both markets and, um, and running money, and then I've been um, running Nucleus for about uh, close to about four years now. Doesn't time fly when you're enjoying yourselves, eh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tim, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I've had uh, nearly 10 years now in, in financial advice. Prior to that, I was actually in engineering, uh, in, in mining engineering game, and I had to make the move under threat of divorce uh, back home and, uh, and essentially uh, find, find a, a new career. And I found financial advice uh, a, a terrific fit, I guess, for what I like to do, which is, which is helping people. Uh, I've worked for a number of the majors, uh, both, uh, I won't name names here, but uh, so, some names that have featured quite heavily in, in uh, Royal Commission's past, so I'm glad to have that behind me, uh, and uh, happy to leave, of course, and uh, and then worked in face-to-face uh, -face advice for, for a number of years as well, uh, putting together portfolios and, and, you know, really really working with clients to, to get great outcomes. Uh, kicked off Nucleus Wealth with uh, Damien, of course, uh, what, nearly four years ago, as, it, as you say, it's, it was amazing how fast time goes. Uh, and yeah, look, you know, really looking forward to sharing some of the, uh, the work and, of course, you know, the systems and, and what we have in place with your audience tonight and, and, and taking it from there, mate. No, terrific. Well, thanks very much. And thanks both for spending some time with us. And it, look, it's just worth um, me uh, emphasising um, to start with, I think, that um, I thought long and hard about 
positioning vis-a-vis -vis Walk the World and uh, DFA and uh, what I should do. I spoke, I've spoke. i spoken to more than 200 people through my one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, which, by the way, let me just uh, plug while I do that. Um, I, this is where I talk to individuals about a particular postcode and uh, look at the uh, financial profile of that postcode and the property and values and those sorts of things. Um, about an hour's conversation. Um, pull out a lot, of, a lot of data and get to... A lot of granularity. A lot of people were really, really um, enthused by that experience. But you know, one of the messages that came through very clearly was um, a broader question about investment and investment strategies. Now, I don't do financial advice. I'm not qualified to do it, and it's not within my bailiwick. But it was clear to me that there was a, a need to try and find an intersection point with the industry about investing and financial advice. Now, the problem is, if, you know, if, I'm, if I'm frank, I'm quite sceptical about uh, the financial advice industry and, frankly, the superannuation and wealth management industry generally. There's a lot of uh, non-transparent activity goes on and a lot of um, fees being taken for not much benefit, in my view. But after a long sort of process of thinking um, and, frankly, working with Nucleus Wealth for a couple of years on the let's understand the economic environment, it's clear to me that they do understand in a similar way to me how things are actually shaping up and given the low interest rates that we're now getting on term deposits and the fact you can't really just leave money sitting there at zero um, it's time to think differently and so that's why I've done what I've done I haven't sort of given up on my objective independent view of what's going on and I will continue to do what I do on that but it allows me then to segue the conversation to help people a little bit more and provide a different set of options within those conversation points. And the thing about Nucleus is they're, one, very transparent. Two, they've got a lot of different things going on and different options and choices. And three, um, you know who you're dealing with because these are the guys. So that was why I ended up doing what I'm doing. So Walk the World is now the overall sort of overarching banner, as it were, um, for what we do. And Walk the World, of course, is my YouTube channel. And from there, you can go to Walk the World Super and Walk the World fund so that's it and uh, you know they run it all they run the ship um do it very well i think and um essentially that's it so you know i'm not i'm not selling out but i am trying to provide an answer to a problem that's clearly a big problem based on the conversations that i've had now what we want to do tonight is three things firstly i want to put a bit of macro in in other words what's going on in the broader economics and uh, uh, damon's going to talk to that Secondly, um, I've got some questions that people have sent through already, and we're going to try and throw those at Tim and Dame. And thirdly, we're going to have questions off the, off the live stream as we go through. So that's the sort of the plan. And with that, um, Damon, I'm going to hand across to you because uh, you've got some rather sporty slides to share. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's sort of three different areas I wanted to run through um, uh, for you, just to, just to sort of kick it off, and I'm I'm sure as of uh, we'll have the, a number of questions coming through as if past visits or any any guide, but um, yeah. So what, and then we'll sort of jump a little bit into um, uh, you know, the investment process and, and how we do what we're doing, and and we're gonna you know a few performance stats and things like that. Uh, you know some of the some more practical questions that people might want to have, but the first thing I wanted to start with was this idea. Um, and not sure if anyone, uh, a lot of you might have already seen this. This is a uh, some Ray Dalio charts. And what they're showing is uh, the three charts at the top are showing how uh, he sees the economy and the, and, um, and the world sort of fitting together as, as, a, as a macro view. And, and, and we think there's, there's a lot of validity to, to his, um, his overall view. And so the, the top, the first one is productivity growth, that, that things gradually get better over time. Um, we go through these short-term debt cycles then as the next craft up and down. Um, and, uh, and finally, there's this big long-term debt cycle that sort of over um, takes much longer to, to play out. And, and so the bottom chart sort of puts all three of those into, into one. So you can see that sort of big long-term chart growing up above the, the productivity line and then a sharp fall back and then up, up you go again. But within that, there's all these other debt cycles. Now, the thing to remember is these are really long-term. <clears throat> So we're talking about, um, or sorry, the, the long-term debt cycle is is talking 50 years plus um, often. So, so the, the, the actual lengths do vary. But the issue is, and, and the way we've been certainly looking at, at this, um, at the coronavirus was, 
where the long-term debt cycle has been going since the 1960s, uh, and we've seen debt you know, increasing quite rapidly, um, it's, it does look like it's getting very close to the peak. Um, we're not sure, we, you know, there's, there were some arguments from some that, that last time in the 2007 was, that was the last one and, and, and there was a deleveraging and, and, and um, uh, I guess our view is that because governments still hadn't sort of leveraged up fully, that there was, there was still scope for another cycle. As, as we sort of hit the coronavirus, you know, one of our views was this was, this was quite likely the, the end of this cycle and we'd, we'd see it push down. Um, what's happened though is we've seen a lot of, um, we've seen a huge amount of government stimulus, a huge amount of, of, um, uh, of central bank stimulus. And the question is, well, can we go another one? And and in this short-term debt cycle, you know, I'd argue that the, the peaks barely even, it's barely even started to roll over. Uh, debt's hardly fallen at all. And um, there's a lot of focus on um, on a lot of different central banks and 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 governments from getting more debt to get more debt out there to try and sort of push this a little bit further. And so, uh, you know, the question is, um, yeah, is this the big one? And, um, you know, I think we're certainly, we're, we're uncertain about whether it's a big one. And, and the longer it goes on, the more we're concerned that, um, you know, cap the, the, the sort of some of the core things with capitalism are being changed um, uh, without too much comment, um, which seems to say that, yeah, we can push this again um, for, for another debt cycle before we're um, before we reach the, the the big one, and we do, and we do need a, a final deleveraging. So, I'm not sure if you want to talk about that first, Martin, or should I, should I jump into the uh, end of capitalism? Is well, that... let, let's just um, pick that up because I think that's a really interesting uh, comment that you've made there. Um, and you know, there's a lot of conversations going on about um, uh, long cycles. You know, Harry Dent, of course, is is, is somebody who's talking about that, and. Yeah. Uh, a, no, a number of people are saying a number of things are coming together. The, but the question is, which is your point, you know, is, is this is this it or are we going to go round the circuit once again? That really comes back to the question of, well, do we really have capitalism now or not? And, you know, if, if all the central banks just going throwing more liquidity in and just keep printing and printing and printing, how mm. much longer can this go on for? And that seems to me to be the most critical question, but almost the most impossible question to try and deal with. Yeah, and I guess I sort of almost, uh, it's probably, uh, I've sort of almost put central banks to the side. I'm like, oh, yeah, they're going to keep spending. Gonna, there's bucket loads of money from them. And, and we've seen what happens in Japan. Japan's obviously kept that going for a long, long time, all funded by central banks. I guess the most interesting part for me at the moment is the, <clears throat> is this next part where, you know, the, the sort of this is capitalism dead part where uh, we know that, um, you have these bankruptcies uh, when people can't afford to pay their um, can't afford to pay their mortgage, or or you've got businesses that can't that that can't um, meet their debts, and we've also got um, you know if people can't pay their rent they get evicted. We've put all those on hold for and initially it was for a short term, it was for a sort of three month period, and then it turned into a six month period, and now we've pretty quickly added another six months to it. Um, and the question is, you know, is there going to be another push in? So most of these are sort of varies around the globe but you know there's a lot sort of expiring at the end of the year or, or sort of march next year is have is there enough cover from the virus for to just keep pushing it out and so i guess what i'm thinking is you might have a relatively weak economy but within that weak economy you've got lots of stimulus being thrown out there pretty indiscriminately and and so it does end up in the right spot um more often than not but it also ends up in with people who, who didn't really need it as well and so You've got this um, inequality growing where um, some people are doing quite well or, and really well. And so they're putting money back into whether it's the housing market, stock markets, um, wherever it is. And then the people that are doing badly and may have actually done really badly are, are either being propped up or um, prevented from, or sorry, not prevented, but um, allowed to keep keep trading insolvent while insolvent or allowed to keep, um, keep you know, accruing more debts, even though they might be bankrupt. And so if that's happening, you're sort of basically taking away a lot of the negatives and, 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 in, and but keeping the positives. Um, yeah, you can see where there's some, you know, there's this whole tension plus central banks thrown in is, is how long can you keep playing this game for before you decide that um, you're either not a capitalist society anymore and, and, and we don't think consequences matter or um, you, get, you start getting some backlash. And it could be, it could be years. So... I think there's certainly um, there's certainly some time to run before um, uh, before that starts becoming an issue. 
So, yeah, so, so I guess I sort of started by, started a few months ago saying, no, this isn't over because um, what's going to happen is uh, central banks and governments are going to have to start suspending capitalism and, and I don't think they'll go there. I think they'll gradually, they'll, they'll, they'll have the view that, no, we need to start bringing it back on again and, and um, uh, you know, and because and, and, that's the structure of our, our, our general economy. But it does appear that, that that's not the case and that um, each, each step is, there's, there's less and less pushback um, to, to each, each push and, and some of them are getting longer and longer in terms of the, the, the time, to, uh, time to recover. The, the inter yeah, the interesting thing there is that, um, you know, there is no evidence, is there, that the increased money printing really um, has any long-term consequence other than creating more of the same. You know, there is an argument, I think, that you could make quite strongly that, in fact, we've um, been doing the wrong things for at least a decade or two, and yep. uh, we haven't really seen any evidence that the strategy has been working. And of course, they just say, well, we'll just throw more money at it and more money at it and more money at it. The question is, at what point does the realization hit that this is not going to work? I mean, look at Japan, look at the Eurozone. They're probably further ahead than we are. We're just following, uh, I guess, a little naively what the Fed's been doing. Um, I'm not sure there's a way out by just no. continuing to do the same again. No, no, I think, I, I think that's exactly right. We need a change. And it's, it's worth noting as well that you know that we've only been off um, the uh, the gold standard for um, uh, fifty years now ish, so it's not like like this is sort of it's basically a cycle. So if there was a structural problem in the in the in what we'd set up in the, in the in the financial system that you couldn't get that inflation and, and it was inherently deflationary, excluding that sort of first initial burst of um, you know energy. Um, to driving inflation and um, uh, and some debt growth and that, that that sort of 1970s 80s period um, you know if there's an inherent problem with it then we need to make changes to the system and but I don't think um, I don't think the political system is ready for changes yet there's a lot of talk about making changes but I don't think it's um, you know it hasn't exhausted um, all, all the bad options yet so it's going to keep exhausting those those bad options until um, until they do, until there's a, a big enough crisis that they um, that they need to make changes. Well, I find it fascinating that there's quite a lot of conversations about the so-called Great Reset, or you know, they quote the uh, the IMF, or they they say the digital dollar's coming, and that's somehow going to magically sort of switch us to a whole new world. Um, mm -hmm. My issue is, I'm not sure that those Great Reset strategies are actually more than just sort of vague thoughts, and I'm not sure it's necessarily going to solve anything. No, that's right. And I think there's a, um, you know, there's this idea as well about, look, do we, is it universal basic incomes or are there these other things you can start bringing in to, to, to help these? And, uh, and I think it's worth going back to other times in history where you've had some rapid technolo technological change that has just put so many people out of work that, you know, the, the real job of government needs to turn into um, these jobs that don't return, how do we get them into different industries rather than trying to say, you um, uh, Prop those, prop the, the the industries that aren't doing well. Prop them up for a bit longer and and hope they'll come back. So um, yeah, so I think there's, uh, I think we could very easily get stuck in this trap of just trying to keep things the way they were, and we just need to do more of the same of what we did last time, and, and hope that um, this time we get a different result, which um, yeah, yeah doesn't seem likely. Well, and the final point there, uh, Damien, it seems to me that the way this works is. It's the, the few percent who are basically are able to sit and wait. And then when the crash happens, they sort of sweep up all the assets cheap and then basically create even more wealth. So this whole process is essentially a process that creates greater uh, diversion, divergence between the normal people and the few percent. Yeah, well, and, and look, I think, you know, you can pretty safely say that, um, you know, that, that Trump being voted in is, is a sign that... Um, there's 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 inherent problems in 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 the system there, and that there's a bunch of people who aren't happy with the way it's going, and so they voted in an outsider to try and to try and fix things. Um, you know, it generally happens that when you know when you go through these problems, you know they they saw them in the 1930s, and and they voted in a bunch of people in, in a, of a similar sort of populist view that um, they came out. They're saying they have the they have the answers, and it's very comforting to know that people have the answers. But um, when they don't, um, that's where you know you start running into to a lot of problems, or, or you get people who who are really in it for their own, you know, trying to enrich themselves and their 
they're um, they're closer allies. Um, you can get some some big political upheaval, and um, you know, the, I think uh, faith in politicians is 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 certainly tapping uh, near time lows. I don't know if you say all time lows, but certainly you know, the, the faith that people have within governments, and and that then uh, starts creating other issues. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think there's to, to me there's a yeah fixing a lot of these equality issues. If if if, if they're not fixed um, by the people who are in power, then um, you're going to find that uh, the, the the ordinary population will keep voting for more and more extreme um, politicians in the hope that somebody will come up with the answer that, that will actually fix the problem. Well, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, Otto has just made the point: the rules of financial gravity remain. Current policies will further enrich the rich and pauperised wage slaves, then inevitably open up the door for a competent Trump-like popularist. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's really exactly right. We need a benevolent dictator with, with charisma. <laughs> is all we, you know, all, we, all we all need, isn't it? Yeah. But you know, and it's 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 a we often use China as well in a similar vein, and um, in terms of how we speak about you know. Economies that have grown in a particular way, where where they have this whole um, economy driven on the back of lots and lots of capital expenditure, and because um, capital expenditure was particularly low in China, um, sort of in the early 2000s, that was really effective, and all this money came flying in, and the economy did fantastically well. Um, but then they started getting into the overinvestment part, and but so many people have been made rich by that initial investment that it's very very hard to change away from it, and they keep trying for the last 10 years. They've been trying to change away from this. Uh, demand-driven um, economy, and they just can't do it because so many people have been made rich from it who, who want to keep keep the the the, uh, the gravy boat going. And I think Australia's got a similar problem in in some of our industries in that there's so much money has been made from uh, both property um, and and sort of all the related sectors within that um, that and a lot of the finance side that. Um, there's policies and, and everything's. If you if you wanted to try and draw away from that, um, so many vested interests and, and people with lots of money who can who can pay lots to um, to, to the politicians of their choice um, will will pay up in order to keep going back to those same policies until you you finally you know until you can't do it anymore. Yeah, now very true. Now you've left the uh, screen share on, so we haven't seen your face for a few moments. I don't know whether you've got right. another slide to share or whether you want to come back. Another slide. Well, Okay. Do the last one, which is yep. the, um, yeah, the clash of cultures. Uh, I'm missing an S on my title there, but the um, I just wanted to highlight a bunch of different things, and this is probably a better one to leave up for a little while. But there's this all these positive factors that are going on at the moment, whether it's government stimulus, um, your low probability of U.S. tax hikes. So, so what I mean there is Joe Biden um, was has got a lot of U.S. tax hikes he wants to put through, but but if he doesn't get the Senate, which looks to be the probably they're going to be the case at the moment, um, is that uh, he's, he's going to really struggle to get those through. Um, the earnings season was actually very good, um, that the recently finished season. We're, so so based on all those, we're still expecting that inequality. I spoke a little bit about that before to, to keep increasing. Um, and then on the flip side, you've got all the, 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 sorry, then I've got a whole bunch of other these other positive factors that are, that are sort of helping drive things. And then on the negative side, You've really got that virus exploding in the northern hemisphere at the moment, and and we watch in particular. I don't I don't watch um, case numbers as much or, or even deaths. I think the key statistic to watch is the hospitalizations because um, there's a that's where uh, economies really start to shut down, and when people start, you know, I, I guess when people are seeing on their nightly news the hospitals are full and people are dying in hospital corridors, it doesn't matter whether there's a lockdown or not a lockdown. People are going to stop going out. And so, um, you know, certainly some states in America that are still encouraging people to stay open despite this. And I think that's where, um, you know, that's, that, that's, that's a key thing, sort of very short term we're looking at. And then valuations are just crazy. Um, we have all these bankruptcies, but as I spoke about, you know, if they keep getting delayed, you know, how much, how longer, how much longer can we keep zombie companies going around for? And, um, and then we, there's this low genuine credit growth as well. So, so you've got these two big sort of forces hitting each other. And then a bunch of other negative ones, but um, the the negative ones um, tend to be sort of shorter term. Um, oh, sorry, the, the positive ones tend to be shorter term, and the negative ones, excluding that virus one, which is sort of very short term coming to a head, um, tend to be a bit longer term, or, or and sort of maybe medium term is probably better a better description for them. So 
uh, you know, you get past that first key negative factor and, and there might be a little bit of clear air in terms of, um, you know, positive views coming out and, and, and not, a lot to, um, not a lot to stand in front of markets and, and central banks that are, that are willing to, to keep throwing money um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, make no mistake. This is a this is an explicit policy. Like this is um, when when uh, Governor Lowe stands up there and says he wants to encourage more risk taking. What he's saying is he wants the people to get their money out of deposits and stick it somewhere else. Stick it in the economy, create jobs, um, hopefully create demand, get inflation going. Like that's that's their plan. And so um, uh, and, and you know we spoke through those factors we spoke about saying uh, the same policies keep getting rolled out. With, with the same results is that um, it doesn't it doesn't really work or it works for a short period of time but this time the boom's a little bit less than the last one and and it keeps fading down um, yeah that's the reason why um, people need to be serious over a longer period of time they need to seriously consider um, what they're doing with their money and uh, whether you can leave it in those assets because um, these central banks with effectively unlimited printing power um, you're right in their crosshairs you, you're the person they want to get out of out of um, out of deposits and into something else to try and uh, drive the economy further. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I should apologise. I um, took my microphone off while I was doing something I forgot to put back on so people didn't hear the earlier question. Just to explain that we've got a private circuit between uh, uh, Nucleus Wealth and myself, which is uh, working fine, but it didn't, we didn't go out. So the, my question was, what about the three million who effectively are reliant on savings and uh, now have you know zero uh, returns on those savings and you answered the question perfectly right I think that's exactly it's a big deal um, and, and it's a, it's a, it's a, a big silent m minority really uh, in in Australia it seems to me uh, of people who now are really struggling to know how to make finances come together and look I know everyone's focusing on low mortgage rates and and cheap debt and all those things. But I can also tell you that from my surveys, a lot of people who've been used to living off um, term deposits um, are very nervous about getting more involved in debt. It, it's just not something they want to do. So they are being cornered, frankly, by the current economic environment we're in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, I would hasten. I mean, look, we're, we're a very conservative manager. Look, we, we only do uh, large cap. Um, stocks sort of around the world, um, government bonds and cash. So, so I'm a bit different to to others that might you might see out there. But uh, you know, I, I sort of feel as if my investments um, or, or what we're trying to do with the word nucleus is really have this core investment that you can then surround things around. But it, but it's low risk. Um, it's only buying the blue chip assets, and and so you get the lower volatility. Um, some will say, oh, you need to you need to gear up. And, and and take advantage of low interest rates and 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 go out and buy assets to, if you actually want to get a decent return, um, uh, yeah. But just I guess it's that, that whole thought that the gearing cuts both ways, and that um, you know when you start gearing up, especially into investments, um, gearing can turn a, an average invest or, or a good investment make it really good, but it can never make a bad investment good. You know, a bad as soon as a, and, and it, it can even turn an average average investment into a poor investment you know so so you just need to yeah I'd be, I'd be very worried about people who are who have a whole strategy of of they need to take on lots and lots of debt at low interest rates and then go and invest that money with a view that that's the only way to to make a, uh, a decent profit on it mm, well the whole idea of that sort of leverage model I think is, is quite concerning but I mean you know the Reserve Bank um, governor has said on a number of occasions people have to have market exposure it's just you know the nature of the beast I, mean, I, I would argue that they are actually driving people away from you know safe secure savings into market exposure yep. which is which is which is a really concerning strategy in a way and a lot of people are really uncomfortable with this yeah um, and so I, I guess the question is so this is the question what do you do do you, do you are you a conscientious objector and say, well, I'm just, I'll accept, but you know, I'll accept that I'm going to have to draw down on my capital and 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 take no risk, or do you start sort of making your way um, further up and 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 take some risk where where possible? I think we'd certainly, um, you know, we'll certainly argue that there's within a, within a blue chip sort of portfolio that's split between cash and uh, shares and bonds and and you know you, you, different currencies, the volatility. Obviously, the volatility is is a lot higher than a than a term deposit where there's no volatility, but it's but it's significantly lower than what you might find in the market. So you, we can sort of see that you know over 
various periods, you know, our, our volatility and, and volatility of similar funds as well, but, you know, we're, we're not the only one out there, um, are, are at least, um, you know, a, a third lower than what the market and, and, and quite often as low as a half the, the volatility you might see in the market. Um, you know, I think certainly we've tried to line our portfolio up so that we don't, um, you know, the, the, if we can hang with the market on the way up, we're, we're pretty happy, or, or, or even if we're slightly behind, as long as when as the markets are falling, we're we're um, we're outperforming on, on that perspective, with the view that you know protecting that capital is is, is pretty key to the whole uh, to the whole equation. But it's it's not a um, you know it's nothing we can, you know you, you can get a guarantee from anyone. Um, but you know I think it's for us anyway. If it's a core part of your money that you you, you want to invest, you, you want to be able to sleep at night knowing that that's not going to evaporate. Um, around that, if you want to play around that with with bitcoins or gold or or um, you know leveraged investments or, or small caps, yeah, go for it. Like that's sort of you know the idea is you do want to have a core the your core um, of your wealth though in in assets that you think are safe, secure, and um, you know, you can see what's there and 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 li liquid as well. You know that's the other. You know, I think a lot of Australians, in particular, um, uh, like to go back to houses when uh, when things go wrong, and, and think of that as a very low risk asset. Um, the problem, you know, problem is it's not an asset you can trade in and out of, and it is very liquid. So when when the proverbial hits the fan, it is very very hard to get out of houses at a, at a, at a reasonable um, reasonable price. And um, you know, if it gets to the stage where you know, you've lost your job or, or or other rates are really low, and and you need to start funding. Um, yourself by selling a house or, or, or things like that, um, it can be it can be problematic because they're just not liquid assets, and and there's other you know lots of other assets out there as well that that are of a similar ilk. They look fine in the good times, but but when things turn bad, um, you just can't get the money out of them, and and that's where you have to find out part of your money in that. But you want to you want to make sure that you you've got liquidity that you know if you need the money you can you can sell things and, and get the money quite quickly. Yeah, very interesting. Now, one question which came up beforehand, this is a, a one submitted. Um, uh, Nick asked, what's the difference between investing and trading? I mean, it, 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 is it a fundamentally different philosophy or is it graded between the two? Uh, it's certainly graded between the two, but I think there's a, um, you know, there's a, I like to think of it as, as a, um, you know, the, the trading side is, is, is a bit like going to a restaurant because you can see lots of people there. And and the the idea is that 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 works quite often, and you can try and chase around and beat. You know, I want to be the first person into the into the new. You know, pushing the trend. Every now and again, you get it completely wrong, and there's you know there's health issues, and there's you know there's other other problems, or it's not even food that you like. You've lined up for an hour for because there's lots of other people, but you don't actually like that food. Like, whereas I think the the investment side is actually trying to put some research into it. Um, you know. Find out the food scores. Is, do, do they actually have cleanliness? You know, where's the chef from? Is he trained? Is, you know, all these types of things that that might actually give you a be much better idea as to whether you should be eating or shouldn't be eating at that that restaurant. So the, I find the trading side um, uh, also it's you it, it's it's probably better than gambling. I think in terms of your odds, the odds are sort of in your favour. But um, the odds are certainly much more in the favour of the house in terms of um, the person that's taking the money to do your trades. Um, wants to encourage you to, to trade more because that's that's their job. If it's a stockbroker or an online broker or whatever, it's their job to try and get you to churn the portfolio over. Um, there's tax issues and um, and other factors that sort of come into this that may mean that trading um, and time is the other thing. Sorry, and so the trading is a. I would I'd be worried if if somebody thought they could quit their job and go out there and compete with you know multi billion dollar hedge funds who have. Um, you know, tens of millions of dollars to, to throw out research and computers that sit right next to the trade computer so they can get in faster. Um, and that somebody is thinking, well, I can, I can quit my job and at home I can just trade in and out and, and, um, and do a better job. <laughs> yeah, there are a few people who claim that they can um, make more by trading Bitcoin or, or whatever. I have to say, good luck with that. I'm afraid that it's not where I'd go, but, uh, you know, each, each their own, I guess. But, you know, what I'm interested in is the... It is that sort of segment of the population who are a little more risk averse, uh, concerned with the economic environment that, that we're in, conscious of very low interest rates and trying to find a way to preserve um, current wealth, but also perhaps create more wealth uh, for the future. I mean, that to me is precisely the sort of um, profile of, of people that I think 
what we've done actually would uh, align to quite well. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think we're certainly trying. That's 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 the market we're trying to to get to, and. and Part of the um, you know, one of our core groups where we're trying to get to as well is is the people who um, well we're happy to obviously have people with high balances but that there's this gap now as as the Royal Commission's been pushing financial planners out of the of the industry that is opening up in this mid market it's probably sub five hundred thousand dollars where um, the amount of compliance that a, a financial planner needs to do to do a full financial plan with everything in it means that it actually becomes cost prohibitive. And so we're, we, we're, what we're trying to do with our scaled advice um, and by including Tim and blogging and podcasting and, and, and giving full transparency into everything we do is try and bridge that gap for people in the middle that we can give enough transparency that people can see what we're up to. Um, if they want to invest in other assets, they can invest around it. Um, but um, and enough to give them that trust that they can see what we're doing and why we're doing it so that if they don't agree, they can, they can pull their money out. Um, it's not a matter of finding out that, you know, six months later that, Hey, my, my superannuation fund was was um, you know invested in in a whole bunch of airports and and all these unlisted assets and and I didn't know about it and 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 they eventually blew up or couldn't get the money out or or whatever it is, you know our whole idea is that 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 transparency side to us is extremely important in terms of um, you know, giving that to people to so that they can hopefully um, develop some more trust within what's ha within what's happening. Yeah, and uh, I want to just uh, touch a bit further on this this sort of channeling of advice, right? Because one of the things that uh, I think is really important for people to understand is there are multiple channels of, of advice available through the, you know, through, through the nucleus offer. Tim, I don't know whether that's something you, you, you're probably, as head of advice, presumably yeah, you've got a perspective. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Martin. Yeah, certainly well in, in my wheelhouse. Um, we've got some slides actually just to sort of run through on this one. Uh, maybe I'll just give... Damien, a moment. I'm not sure if you can share and I can talk, but anyway. Um, so essentially, the way that we approach the advice process is uh, a kind of like a triage method in a way. So there's three different pathways. Uh, the first one allows people who don't want advice and they've done their own work and, and homework on our portfolios and they just like to build their own blend or effectively, um, you know, make a start on something and, uh, and be comfortable with that and make their choice. Uh, the, the middle one is limited advice. And then uh, the final one is full advice. Uh, full advice just puts uh, effectively means that um, we need to make potentially make a referral to uh, an external party. Uh, and we use a, a nationwide uh, panel of advisors that we can make a referral to obviously on a non-commercial basis. Uh, so the limited advice one, the middle path is the interesting one. So nine times out of 10, I actually recommend people to, to try it out. It is, uh, it does give you free uh, and instant advice uh, by, by working through that. It's essentially a uh, what they call a risk profiling tool, very common in the, in the investment uh, advice landscape. And what that does then is it gives us the ability to effectively uh, make a recommendation on what we feel is an appropriate blend uh, of, of what we do here with our portfolios. Um, so it covers off on things like uh, your uh, previous investment experience, how comfortable you are with volatility, and of course, time frame for investment as well, which is a, a crucial component in getting those risk levels right. Um, one thing as well, of course, is we don't do any product comparison at all here at Nucleus because obviously we'd be seen, or we certainly feel that that is, uh, would be seen as conflicted and we wouldn't be comfortable with that. Uh, and so that's where if people are looking for a, a product comparison as opposed to just coming in and having a look at what we can do for them, uh, we'll, we'll make a referral out to uh, a third party uh, independent advisor to, to make a decision on, on what's appropriate for them. Um, jumping through now to um, the, the next one there, Damien, if you could make the, uh, yep, there we go. Uh, so so when going through the limited advice path, uh, effectively when, when I said before that um, we can do a blending, that's exactly what we do. So we've got three different portfolios, uh, a high uh, growth one, which is called tactical growth, and then two quite conservative ones, one with a growth focus and the other one with an income focus called tactical accumulation and income. And by going through the, the risk profile and asking questions about things like if you prefer or need income over growth, we're then actually able to blend for you uh, these uh, a, mi a mixture of these three portfolios that all largely hold uh, the same assets, but obviously just in different weightings. Uh, and it's quite a unique way that we can actually really zero in on getting the, the risk levels right in uh, in each client's portfolio on a, on a client by client level. Yeah, great. Okay, let me just uh, come come back to that because I've got a couple of questions that are linked to that. Far away. <laughs> a few a few a few people are. Uh, 
uh, are saying, hmm, yeah, it sounds a bit um, sort of salesy, but we're just trying to provide people with a little bit of context here, right? So the first thing is this idea of there are some people out there who want a mechanism to direct their own decisions quickly and effectively into the market and see the results. So that that's covered off. There are some people who want a bit of advice, a bit of information to help steer it. But there are also people who need much more specific advice. And frankly, finding a financial advisor is, is very complicated. So you mentioned the panel there. Um, ha what, what screening process do you use in terms of, you know, who uh, effectively gets referred to a, an advisor and which advisor? Is, is there a mechanism that you use? How does that work? Yeah, great question. So look, the way that we approach that is effectively when you select either of the three options, uh, we then highlight effectively, or you need to check boxes to go any further on, on actually making sure that this, this, this option you're aware of, um, I guess it's limitations in a way, um, and, and that there are other options available. So um, in, in say for the, the limited advice, which is a very common one, probably 60% plus or more of our, our clients to come through online, uh, actually come in under advice so it's it's obviously very important for people to know that you know somebody else has had a had a look at it and been able to recommend something um but it's very clear on saying things like we're not going to consider things like retirement plan we're not going to consider uh you know insurance advice uh we're not going to consider uh retirement planning uh or sorry uh, uh, estate planning and things like that as well and so it's actually it's not just saying okay let's just go ahead it's about saying well look these are other areas that you might want to think about and if, and if so, we're very mindful of the fact that the online method is, is not going to be able to satisfy, um, you know, or do that job properly. And so it's essentially then if we, we can move across and, and, and move into that full advice space. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, panel nationwide uh, independent advisors there. Uh, I've met a lot of them. Uh, they're great guys, uh, well respected in the industry. And, and, you know, we've got no problems referring uh, our clients to there and knowing that they'll be uh, looked after. And I think I think it's worth knowing um, as well, Martin. There's a lot of um, you spoke before about conflicts in the industry. So, so the ones we're dealing with are the advisors who don't get paid from products. They all have um, they're all independent, so they only get paid from the the money that people actually pay them. So you don't have to worry about the the sort of backhanders or, or things happening in the background that you've been put into products because that was the one that paid the highest fee. There's no money exchanges hands between us or any of the advisors there's no we, we provided at a completely arm's length and, and and as tim was saying before you know this idea of no product comparison is, is where everyone runs into trouble in the um the royal commission and why the banks have all been or were initially selling their financial advice arms because if you turn up to to cba and say um should i sell my a and p policy and, and give it to you of course the cba goes, says, says yes because he's going to get a commission on it whereas what we've come is saying well we don't think we can do that so if you if you want a comparison between our product and somebody else's we'll give you a referral to an independent person we're not taking any commissions it's all at arm's length um but if if you come to us and say yeah okay i've chosen to go with you we'll definitely give you advice about which of the which of our products is the right for your risk profile and what suits from an investment perspective and that and a little bit around the structures we can sort of point you in the right direction but um what we're not doing is coming out to people and saying yes we will um, we'll, we'll end up with conflicted advice where we're telling people to get out of one product and into our product, which um, yeah, obviously pays us more money than, than somebody else's product. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You've also left the, the uh, screen share on, so I'm not sure whether you want to uh, continue to talk to slides or whether you want to come back to your... your yeah, hey, there you go. Um, yes. one, one, of the other, one of the other questions that we got beforehand was... Um, you've got this sort of ethical screen and you've got this sort of preference structure that you can sort of, I don't want banks or I do want banks and those sorts of things. Um, mm. I guess the, the question is, is, is that based on sort of individual preference or is there some other rationale as to why you might go X rather than Y? I'm just trying to understand what the context would be for using that sort of selection process. Yeah, so the idea behind this is we really wanted to give personalization, And I was just looking at... Um, uh, you know, I was talking to Tim a little bit earlier today and we had a slide up from a, from a competitor who was sort of showing that they had their, um, you know, they had their um, unit trust, their managed funds, traditional managed funds. They had some listed investment companies and then they had their um, managed accounts that the, the high net worth people would come to these managed accounts. And so that was what it was like when you're at a big stockbroker, somebody will turn up and say, you know, I've got a million dollars to invest. And they'll say, yeah, throw it in the, um, throw it in the managed fund. Oh, sorry, a big, a big fund manager. Throw it in the managed fund with everyone else. And, you, and your tax positions get mixed up and there's a few other issues within the managed fund structure. But 
um, and you might end up paying slightly higher fees. Uh, and then the bigger accounts, though, can turn up and say, "No, no, no, I don't want to go in the I don't want to go in the, um, the, the the trust with everyone else. I want a separately managed account. I want one that's just in my name. Um, I don't have to worry about other people's trading issues. I don't have to worry about other people's tax issues. Um, and if I want to be able to say um, I don't want any tobacco within that fund, then that can be run without tobacco. Whereas in the managed fund itself, everyone gets the same. There's no there's no picking and choosing." And the benefit of these, and so, so high net worth individuals and, and family officers have been using these managed accounts for, for 20, 30 years. But what's been happening is um, the fees have been coming down. And there's a number of uh, players out there um, sort of trying to push techno technologically push these down. And they're at a stage now where, where we basically decided, look, we can actually run um, the portfolios the same way the high net worths get it. Um, and we don't need to put, you know, $200 million into these accounts or, or $100 million into these accounts to make it work. We can do it with $50,000 or $10,000. And, so, um, and so the idea was that what we then wanted to put was, um, you know, ethical choices, they're not black and white. Um, and everyone's got a different view. You know, Martin, you might quite reasonably think that smoking is terrible and addictive. And um, Tim thinks that, um, but you think gambling's fine because it's somebody's choice. And Tim thinks exactly the opposite. And so rather than us making sort of ethical decisions on behalf of customers, we want, the, we want them to actually sort of tick the box and take those stocks out of the portfolio themselves. So if they feel strongly about a particular, um, you know, whether it be, uh, we've got 30 something odd screens on there, whether it be from, um, you know, women on boards to uh, climate change to, to nuclear power, those types of factors we put back in the, the hands of the investors um, who could make that decision about, you know, is this an ethical product in their mind or, or not? And, um, and do they want to make money from companies that, that, in, that are involved in that process? Yeah, absolutely on that. Now, the other question that uh, has come up a few times is transparency. Now, of course, it, it's a digital platform, so people can go in and pretty much see where things are pretty much all the time. And, I, and you know, having looked around the market quite a lot, um, the level of transparency that you guys are actually exposing yourself to is pretty remarkable, frankly. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's uncomfortable transparency, as I, as, I, as I say. You know, it's it's the stage where um, you get to see our mistakes as well as our um, as, as well as our wins. Um, so I was just going to show. I had a few charts. So so on every stock that's 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 in the portfolio, we have a, a two page sort of profile that sort of goes into you know why is it in there? What do we think about um, its business model and what's different about it? And 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 the idea is that it's not it's not this isn't an historical factor. It's not about saying what happened in the past. It's about actually saying what's going to happen, what do we think is going to happen next year? And what is what is the reason for this being within it? Um, we break down we break down the um, uh, the settings as well to have your cash and actually Tim, do you want to, do you want to go through these ones? That might be a good question for you actually. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, so yeah, so we've got, we've got a, a terrific client dashboard. Um, that is available for um, all of our clients, obviously invested. And um, we also have some, uh, I've got some sample videos if anyone likes to, to reach out. I'm uh, always happy to share those as well. It's available now on our YouTube channel. Um, it looks a terrific, terrific amount of insight, you know, and look, this is part of, I guess, my experience in dealing with client portfolios and, and, and wanting this sort of information, you know, to share with your clients and, and, and having it in, in a digital format for them to, to see anytime they like. Um, a lot, a lot of, I guess, you know, the, the, the unknown is, is taken away by, by having a lot of information about, say, whether or not you're underweight or overweight certain areas. Um, and, and we've been able to provide this in such a way where um, effectively we can do it on a sector level. So at any time you can see your, your exposures to various sectors in, in the market, country level as well, um, and then drill right down, as, as Damien showed before, into an individual stock analyst report, um, which is actually a cut down version of what our investment teams use. So, uh, you know, it's good quality. Um, and that's always available um, for any holding in your portfolio as well. Okay, that's uh, that's good to see. Um, one other question that's just come in, uh, you, you, whether you want to answer this or not, what was the performance like over the last three years? So, any oh, thoughts? Uh, that, that sounds like a Dorothy Dixon, somebody with somebody who knows us, yeah. Look, performance, we don't want to pitch ourselves too much on performance because performance can come and go, you know, and, 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 and I think we've got the structure, we think we've got the structure right, we've got certainly the transparency in telling people how we're positioned, why we're positioned that way. So, um, if we look at other super funds, so our tactical growth is in the top 10 um, of like, yeah, there's hundreds of these different funds out there. This is, yeah, and um, 
you know, I think we're, we're number three over the last year. And, and actually some of the number one was actually limited. It's not actually a public offer fund. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly up there in terms of performance. Um, our international one is, is similar. Um, our growth and, uh, sorry, our, our income and, and accumulation are, are, aren't top 10, but they're, they're, they're certainly in the very much into the top quartile. So, um, yeah, so three years has been very good with the big disclaimer um, that, you know, past performance isn't future performance. Um, and, um, you know, while we certainly hope we're doing our best to, to get there, um, and, and we're, we're certainly being ex as open as we can as to, to what we're doing, um, you know, it does, it's, not a, um, it's, it's not a guarantee of, uh, of future performance. No, particularly now with, of course, uh, you know, all of the uh, vagaries that we discussed earlier, right, in terms of the way that the uh, economies around the world are going and the virus and all, all of those things. Um, I guess, the, 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 you know, time, time will tell, but the point is, it's transparent so people can actually see where things are going and you know that if you compare that with a lot of other funds and I've had the unfortunate experience of trying to understand the fees and structures and you know in, in a lot of other funds it's impossible to know you just don't know what's going on so this is a degree of transparency which is pretty pretty impressive I think personally yeah and we do try and I mean the fees is a good example thing where we, we try and keep a flat fee across every asset class because the thing is we don't want you to worry that um, you know arguably what we should do is charge more for international a little bit less for uh, Aussie and, and and less for bonds whereas what we've decided to do is flatten it out um, so that you don't have to worry, well, these guys are buying lots of international. Is that because they collect a higher fee on that? Or is it because they really believe international is going to go well? Um, and, and, and we run, you know, Tim went through um, hundreds of different PDSs from uh, all, our, all our competitors to try and put through a bit of a, because um, it's part of our, our, our onboarding process, we'll show you what sits in the PDS. And um, a lot of them just have these really wide ranges. You know, they can charge from very low fees to, to extremely high fees. But... Um, there's no say about which one it will be. If they decide they want to buy a bunch of hedge funds because they've decided that, then then you might actually end up with a lot higher fees one year than, than the next year. So, no, that's a good good point too. Um, Tim, there's one fun for you here, uh, which um, again came in beforehand. Um, the, the, the question basically was around: Look, um, this is very much digitally enabled, right? Um, what about people who are less comfortable with? online tools and digital enablement. Is there another way of engaging, which, you know, more traditionally as well? Yeah, look, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a terrific question, Martin. Uh, look, the, 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 I guess the primary way is if for people to get on board is, is, is certainly online. Now, I'd like to think through the 600, 700 odd clients that have come through, um, we've sort of run the gamut of, of all, uh, you know, people that have been comfortable in, in, in getting there. Now, that being said, um, look, one of the beauties of our model, uh, and this is sort of where we're trying to meet in the middle in between the, the, the pure digital space and then obviously the, the, the high cost face-to-face -face advice uh, options in the market, is the ability for us to actually, um, you know, pick up the phone. There's a human touch. Um, and so for mine, um, look, if, if, if someone was to head over to uh, walktheworld.com, uh, or sorry, walktheworld.nucleuswealth.com, which is the portal, walktheworld.com is obviously a .com.au is your page. Um, the, and, they, and they made a bit of a start and they just felt a bit flummoxed or something like that, then of course, uh, the first thing you need to do is just pick up the phone or, or send us an email to contact at nucleuswealth.com uh, with the idea being that, you know, we can step you through there uh, in a time that's suitable for yourself. Um, the, online, the online piece obviously is fantastic for people that love using, you know, technology and are comfortable with technology, but I guess at the end of the day, um, not everyone's like that and so we need to meet in the middle on that one. Yeah, thank you. People pop in from time to time into the office, and uh, well, when we're allowed in the office, well, I guess we're back. We're allowed back in now. We're we're in Melbourne, so um, but we we do do um, you know a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away when when we're allowed to travel around the the, the country, we um, we did some seminars, you know, on on a regular basis in in most capital cities, to, so that people could actually see us and come and ask questions and and spend more. You know, if they needed to spend more time, they can spend more time. Right. No, that's that's good. And then the other question, which uh, again beforehand, um, perception is uh, not just Australia, right? You actually have reach into a various uh, international domains as part of your portfolio. Absolutely. That's a um, yeah. That's that's key to us. That, that, that especially because we've limited ourselves to large capitalisation stocks, and, and really within Australia, there's there's somewhere between fifty and and a hundred of those, um, depending upon how you want to measure it. But um, so, so you really do need to get exposure. 
um, to, to other countries offshore. And we see that um, you know, the Australian economy is dominated by banks and, and, and resources to, to an extent you just don't see elsewhere. And so if you, if you go through your day and work out you know, what car are you driving and, and what toothbrush you, uh, toothpaste are you using and, and shampoo you're using and all those types of things, um, very few of those happen to be listed in Australia. And um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's often a reason to be putting those in, in your portfolio and just getting that, that much broader reach of, uh, of what's available. So how does that um, then square up with exchange rate risk? How do you deal with that? Yeah, look, um, it, we, take into, we take into account the exchange rate risk as, as we're investing. What, what is very handy as an Australian investor that you don't get elsewhere is that um, the Australian dollar is treated as a bit of a, a supercharged um, uh, play on the world economy. <laughs> and so what that means is, when we hit times of trouble like we did earlier this year and the, the Aussie dollar fell dramatically um, from whatever 70 odd cents down to 55, it actually acts as a cushioner on your, on your international shares. So Aussie, the, the Aussie dollar fell 20%, um, international shares fell say, say 30%, well, you're only down 10. And then as the market, the, the thing is it works the opposite direction on the way back up. So as the, the market rose quite dramatically and the Aussie dollar did as well, then, then you're giving up those, those gains. But what it does mean is that it can give you that, that real shock absorber effect. So, so while um, you, a lot of the research you'll see come out of, um, say, places like the US or, or, or Europe, when they talk about um, investment risk and, and the risk of buying international shares, doesn't actually work the same way for, for Australian investors. And so, so we look upon it um, you know, at certain times of the cycle as being um, a great way of, of being able to have a bit of an each-way bet on, on economies with a, a bit of a cushion if, if things do go wrong. Yeah, very interesting on that as well. And, um, you know, the, 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 the question, of course, about the Aussie dollar is, you know, is it going to go higher? It's 73 now or is it going to go lower like the Reserve Bank wants, right? <laughs> My own read at the moment, it's probably going to go higher rather than lower. What, well, what, we spoke the other day, didn't we, that uh, you know, the, the RBA came out and said um, – We'd like to have lower interest rate. Sorry, we'd like to have a lower Australian dollar, and the Australian dollar promptly rose to sort of two or three cents. So yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the old jaw boning it didn't quite work. Maybe they should try saying the opposite yeah, to try and true. drive it drive it the other way, right? Yeah. Um, well, and, and I think I think you you brought up this on our show. I'll I'll, I'll I'll put it back to you. Is that yeah? Everyone's been playing this game for a lot longer than we have. Um, yeah. The the uh, Japan's been there for twenty years. Um, yeah, Europe's been there for ten. And, and in the US, and so they've all been out there printing money trying to get the currency down. Um, Australia's late to the game, and uh, they, they need to do more if that's what they, if they want to get the currency law. Yes, well, they just sort of said that we've got plenty of ammunition in the locker, right? But you, yeah. you just wonder really how much they have. Um, now, what, one of the sort of the, the, the broader questions, I guess, ahead is um, how the economy is, is, is going to play out, right? And presumably you've got in your mind some sense of, of how you think this is going to work over the next two or three years. My, my sense is that um, we're going to see more money printing. We're going to see rates, interest rates as low or lower than they are. Yep. We're probably going to see the stock markets still quite bubbly, if up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, mm. Particularly, of course, every time a virus, uh, uh, you know, antidote or uh, inoculation is actually announced, then the market say whoopee and they off, go off again. Um, yep. But but my question is, in in this highly volatile environment, um, you know, do you, do, you, do, you, do you just sit there and sort of ride through it, or or do you try and um, take advantage of the of the volatility? Yeah, look, we, we um, think there's a, there's a bit of scope for the volatility, and I think that's probably your best bet of getting a return over the next um, sort of five to ten years is actually uh, making that assumption that look, when markets are relatively high, it's time to be tipping out, and when markets are relatively low, it's time to be time to be getting back in. Um, I think we're certainly doing that within within markets as well as um, within um, yeah, so so within the actual markets as well as within um, between. Bonds versus versus equities. Uh, I think you you present your scenario analysis of, of different different ways things can come out, and, and and we do a very similar analysis ourselves in terms of you know road mapping and trying to work out what's the upside and downside in each case. So there might be times where we think, look, 
we're going to pick we're going to have a certain allocation you know maybe a little bit more equities than what we what we might like because we're worried about the downside and we do think there's a there's a scope to, to fall and there'll be other times where um you know we're, we're comfortable as well getting a little bit more and um you know with the view that maybe we're, we'll we we'll might be take a little bit more protection on the bonds and, and then go a little bit longer on the equities or, or vice versa so um you know to us it's about trying to make all those different assets work together uh, we don't. We're not keen to trade and turn over our portfolio in, in large amounts. Um, but having, you know, we sort of target trying to get about thirty odd percent, less than thirty percent turnover in a year. And because we're in separately managed accounts, that can be quite tax effective because we can, you know, come come the end of the year, we'll we'll have a look at losses and what we can sell and 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 offset gains. But um, I do want to say that over the last year, we've we've turned over more than that. Um, and. It's, it's quite possible over the next few years, um, you know, there, there might be a bit more going on just in terms of um, as opportunities arise, um, you just need to be a bit more nimble than, than in the past of, of um, you know, taking advantage of them. Yeah, very uh, important, I guess. And then uh, one other question which has come up several times, both on the chat and, and prior, um, the old inflation deflation um, debate, right? Yep. <laughs> in fact, I um, chatted with Steve Van Meter this morning. He's a macro an analyst uh, in the US who's on the deflationary side. I spoke with Peter Schiff the other day who's on the inflationary side. I'm talking to Harry Dent tomorrow. Guess which side of the equation he's going to be on. Um, yeah. the, there is a real polarization out there, right? Which which is, is I'm not under, well, I sort of have some theories about why it's polar. But mm. what's your perspective on this inflation deflation uh, conundrum? Yeah, sure. So, so I guess my take is very much that um, it's it's deflationary until until proven otherwise. Is that there's been the arguments and um, there was a list of you know extremely famous and and um, qualified economists who all went to the Fed. Um, ben Bernanke when he started doing this massive amounts of money printing and told him that you know. Um, hyperinflation was was the thing, and and it was it was going to, all going to be his fault, and and there's all these issues. People have been warning for a long time about inflation, and it will eventually come because um, that's where you know. But but it, it will need changes to what we're doing at the moment. What we're doing at the moment, and the whole banks, central banks get out and spend more money. Um, governments borrow a bit and do a bit, but they don't. You know, they they try and balance a bit, and they they pull back, and they're they're, they're worried about inflation getting out of control all the time. In that environment, I don't think we can see any sustained inflation for a long period of time. So I'm looking for a fundamental change, whether it be modern monetary policy, whether it be a, um, you know, a, a proper clear out of debt, debt jubilees, letting people go broke, whatever it is that needs to clear this debt, because um, with the amount of debt out there at the moment and the amount of inequality, um, I just can't see what will actually get out to, to cause inflation. And the, the, the inequality side, I could spend another whole podcast talking about, but but the, the, the thumbnail sketch is, um, you know, if I give Gina Reinhardt another $1,000, um, she's going to throw it on the pole and save it. If I give, um, you know, a, a homeless person in the street $1,000, they're going to rush out and spend it straight away. And so if you want to get demand and you want to get um, inflation going, you, um, you, you, you have less inequality. And if you've got more inequality, then, then you end up with um, these deflationary pressures. And, and there's no real sign that um, that, that inequality is, is reversing at any time soon. Yeah, that's probably right. And, uh, you know, I, I t tend to have the same view. If they continue to do the same as they've been doing, mm. it'll probably be deflationary unless they break out and do something different. And then the question is, well, how does that happen? And when does it happen? Timing and what have you. Yeah. And, what and you have to argue with the, the, the Senate set up it's, it's very hard to see that in the US Senate set up now, it's, it's going to be hard to see that, um, you know, massive amounts of money being spent. Mm. Now, what about the um, US election? You know, presumably Biden versus Trump. I'm not sure actually who's going to win. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, very interesting uh, bet that John Adams has placed. He thinks that uh, Trump's going to actually be able to sort of claw it back. Other people say, no. Is it going to make a difference, do you think, the result? Well, look, the House and the Senate are divided. I mean, I, I, it's is he going to overthrow the the House votes as well? Like, well, I, I'm a bit more a bit more worried if that gets to the stage. So, um, you know, I guess I'm I'm more on the side that I don't no, I don't think I don't think Trump's done at this stage. Um, I think the Senate runoff is 
Probably. Well, actually, I don't really know. The Senate, the Senate runoff, I'm not sure about. I think I'll, I'll put it down as 50-50. The vote was pretty close to 50-50. And I don't know if there's going to be a bunch of Trump supporters who don't turn up because Trump's no longer in the election or if there's going to be a bunch turn up to, to teach the Liberals, you know, that, that they, you know, that, that they should have the power in the, in the Senate. So, so that part I'm not sure about. I think the... Um, the danger from an inflation perspective, and, and when I say danger, it's it's in a very, very small font because I don't think it is particularly dangerous. We really do need to see inflation. Was that Biden gets, does a clean sweep and, and goes out and spends bucket loads of money? Um, and I think that's off the table. So uh, if Trump gets back in, then, um, well, he doesn't, we don't really know what he was going to do. Maybe some more tax cuts. Maybe there's, maybe does he mess up healthcare or not? Who knows? Um, it's probably just a bit more of the same. So certainly business friendly. Um, so yeah, you know, I prefer to be I prefer to be a business in the US rather than a worker in the US. If Trump was president, um, it goes back a little bit more towards the worker under under Biden. So and, and that's a bit short term, long term, isn't it? So, so good to, good to be a business in the short term. But if your workers aren't getting enough money and you're not getting enough demand, then the medium term looks pretty bad. So so I sort of feel as if Biden is, is probably better for the the market in the medium term. But you know, maybe from a profitability perspective, Trump might be better in the short term. Well, I think both sides are going to be hobbled by whatever happens, right? So there's, a, there's going to be contention, which means that some of the policy outliers probably won't happen, which means it's going to be slightly more centralist. But um, I, well, I, you, hope so. you, hope, you hope that they do find ground in the, in the middle of the meet <laughs> rather than just being, I mean, may, maybe it just ends up being a bit of a nothing thing that nothing gets done over most of the period because both sides are take extremist positions and neither will, will budge. So. Yeah, well, it's been, been done before in, in the US. Um, mm. Now, we're sort of coming up towards the, the end of the show. Um, Tim, there's one last question for you if you're still there, and it's a very simple question. What's the minimum to invest? Yeah, sure thing, Martin. So uh, our minimum in our, in our technical range is $10,000. Uh, and what we've done is we've essentially put, put together um, a, a range of different ways that we build portfolios. It goes starts at ten thousand, uh, and then we get to our flagship range, which has about a uh, hundred or so holdings uh, north of, of two hundred k. But at ten thousand, you're sort of looking at ETFs, and then it, what we do is we trade out or swap out ETFs for direct equity exposure as as the um, the investable amount increases. So um, yeah, look, it's a, it's a good fit, and it, it obviously maintains a high level of diversification uh, in the portfolios. Right. And that's the point, isn't it? That you can start small and build um, if, if things go right. I mean, yeah. you, don't have, you don't have to commit everything on day one, as it were. No, that's right. And look, so many of our investors, and indeed, I think anybody who um, is, is, you know, starting with a, a new wealth firm or, you know, they're, they're trying something out, a, a walk before you run approach, uh, I think is warranted and, and makes perfect sense. Uh, look, the, the great thing about these, uh, and we've spoken a little bit about in the structure that we use, these separately managed accounts, is that they actually lend themselves to uh, being able to make you know constant contributions or one-off contributions along the way, um, and the ability um, for them to actually group together brokerage. And uh, we haven't spoken about this too much, but you're happy to get in touch, and I can uh, go go through this further with uh, anyone who who wants to hear me talk about it. Um, but look, yeah, the the, the platforms give uh, a wealth of uh, of benefits by having direct share ownership that's beneficially and legally owned by the client. Um, but the, of course, the brokerage issue, which is the, um, the you know the big problem with holding individual shares, is minimised through them doing these book building processes. And you're looking at one to two dollars a, a, an Aussie trade and three to four dollars a direct international trade, which is uh, pretty good in anyone's book, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, and then just one last question from the uh, the stream. Um, this uh, maybe if you damn it, unemployment in Australia, right? The official number is probably north of the real number. Um, hmm. Is that going to have a significant impact in terms of the local economy and, and how you're reading the unemployment? Yeah, look, absolutely going to going to have a uh, going to have a difference. I think we we tend to look at the underemployment, um, and I think the big factor we see the, the most important factor we see uh, that affecting is is that uh, coming back to that inflation and that we're just not going to get wage growth of any meaningful amount um, until you can actually see that unemployment rate coming down. And um, and it's starting to um, you know, get competition to jobs, and that, that, that we actually start to need need to pay higher amounts. I mean, the front page of the Australian on the weekend was talking about um, you know Scott Morrison had just pulled just wound all these public servants back, so they're only getting one percent wage growth. And 
And then on the flip side, you turn around and, and the, the RBA is saying, we need wage growth, we need wage growth, we need wage growth to get this going. And you say, well, the government just said he's not going to pay its people and the private sector is not going to pay its people because they don't have to because it because because um, unemployment's so high. And so, um, you know, that's one of those factors. Until you can start seeing unemployment come down to levels that it can actually see wages get 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 um, start to grow, then um, it's, it's very hard to see, um, you know, a positive outlook for um, for the economy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, all the data that I'm seeing in my surveys suggests that um, real income is static, costs mm. are rising, and the forward expectations from the SME sector is they won't be able to pay any increases at all. In fact, some SMEs are likely to fall over over the next few months. So it's not looking very good. And it's sort of real world versus the RBA, you know, view of the world. There's a big gap. Yeah, that's right, and that and that's that that we spoke at the start about it. But it's good. It's a good place to finish. It's that real um, tension that we're sitting with those positives and negatives about saying, okay, if you keep backing all the, if you keep trying to get all the bad things to go away by by giving them more money or lending them more debt or letting them letting them not go bankrupt for a longer period of time, then you can hold this together for another six months, twelve months, eighteen months, whatever before before you really need, do need to start um, running into these troubles. But um, if you do start seeing that they say, well, no, we're, we do, now we do want, um, we are going to let people go bankrupt or, or, or we're going to start enforcing some of these conditions, then you can see some things turning um, quite dire, uh, you know, relatively quickly if they, if they let it get out of control the other way. And so the, 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 the tension at the moment, it seems to be throwing more at the, the problem than what it warrants and um, or what, it, you know, more than what, what I, I think it would warrant. But um, at, at the risk of moral hazard, but um, that certainly seems to be the way we're going. Yeah. Well, that's right. And of course, we've got the uh, zombie firms um, trading insolvently. At some point, that will unwind. We've got the uh, job keeper and job seeker winding off. We've got the um, uh, principal interest repayment holidays coming to an end. My own view is all that's just going to get kicked on. Yeah. And that's 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 my fear. I, th I think you're right. I, I'm 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 treating in the portfolio. Um, that's the way we're treating it. And that's a, that's one thing you know we need to come back to is there's one part about saying, look, I don't want this thing to happen. I I, I do think they need to start weaning off and 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 actually you know taking some of these losses. But um, from an investment perspective, um, it it seems pretty obvious that you're exactly right. If if the if it, if it can be delayed for longer, then then it'll be delayed for longer. And if it's if we can make it through the next election, that's that's all we really care about. We'll worry about we'll worry about what the fallout is after that. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and thanks very much, uh, guys, for tonight. Um, I'm just going to play my little thing one more time because I can. Just to say that um, if you want to find out more, then there's a very simple way to go. Just go via Walk the World to Walk the World com.au from there you can navigate through to the uh, the two different funds as well as to the dfa homepage and other things too and uh, that sort of is now my my new if you like super homepage. so that that's that now um i'll just come back to, uh, to damien and tim any uh, last uh, thoughts from either of you? you you first tim uh yeah sure so look i guess uh, we've spoken a little bit about the um the online onboarding and and, and, and having a bit of a look at um, the opportunity that, you know, in, in the partnership we've put together with Walk the World Fund and Super. Um, and so look, head over to walktheworld.nucleuswealth.com, um, which is the the, the beginning uh, login page for that. Of course, you can head to walktheworld.com.au and, uh, and, and guide your way through the various fund pages as well that we've put together. Um, and yeah, going back to the portal, um, essentially, look, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, it's all online. Uh, it's it's completely you know paperless as well, which is quite handy. You can start and stop at any time. And importantly, there's absolutely no obligation to invest in using the portal. So if you want to go in and have a bit of a look, shows you the portfolios, does all the tailoring we've spoken about today, uh, you're more than welcome to. Or of course, reach out and uh, yeah, always happy to have a chat. I've been chatting to to quite a few of the uh, of the viewership of, of the Walk the World group, and they've been a uh, a really really enjoyable time over the last uh, few days since we've launched. So I'm looking forward to plenty more. Please. Uh, reach out and chat and uh, yeah, we can continue the conversation. Yeah, Great. I've got um, I've got a request for your uh, listeners and, and viewers, actually. So we, we um, there's, there's two sides to this. One side's the investment side, the other side's the structuring side. And the whole idea that we want to give all this transparency and, and, and structures that we think are the most tax efficient and, and you know, have custodians and all these other factors behind to sort of protect people's money. 
Um, is that if, if you see anything that, that you feel uncomfortable with or you don't think is best practice out there, we'd love to know about it because we have tried to genuinely put something out there that we think um, the, the whole structure and, and, and factors behind it is something that's going to... This is this is a way most funds will look in, in 10, 15 years' time because it's what um, the high net worths want right now. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the invite to say, look, we're trying to do this genuinely um, as, as, a, as an attempt to, to sort of bring more um, transparency and, 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 and um, you know, really help the, the, the financial industry sort of move forward. So uh, we'd love to know about any, any problems you have or, or concerns, even if you don't want to invest, but, but you'd just like to let us know, um, you know what it would take um, and, and what you think we're doing wrong, then, then we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Tim, and thanks, Damien. And the point about this, this is the human face of investing, right? Uh, mm. <laughs> what I wanted to stress today was that this isn't some big faceless entity that uh, has a big brand but nothing much else, right? This is actually real people who actually care about what they're doing, which is one of the reasons why we've aligned, because we've got an alignment in terms of economics, we've got an alignment in terms of um, outcomes and intent, and, uh, you know, the transparency thing is, I think, pretty important. So, guys, thank you very much for spending uh, the time with us tonight. Really appreciate it. I know you, you're a bit busy, but, uh, you know, I think uh, people have been very appreciative. Um, and uh, I think we've made it clear as to how people can pursue from this point if they'd like to follow up. Um, I'm not going to do a big ongoing push, you know, through through the, uh, the, the, uh, the community here. I, I think people have enough uh, sense to understand that if it makes sense, they'll, then they'll go go pursue but we will just from time to time just mention it in passing and uh, uh, the idea is that perhaps we'll get you guys to come back and spend a bit more time in you know each month perhaps thinking specifically about some of those economic questions and the macro questions and how it's beginning to shape what you're doing so um, you're welcome to come back on the show uh, down the track thanks a lot yeah thanks Martin yeah really appreciate it cheers great okay so I'm going to just turn you guys off and then I'll just close out the show so just uh, hold on Right, so there we are, guys. Thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, appreciate all your comments in, in the chat. been very interesting. Just to tell you that next week um, we will be, uh, if I push the right button, we're going to switch tracks and talk about first-time buyers and the conundrum that they face. I've had so many people ask me about what first-time buyers should be thinking now. And um, I'm going to have a guest on the show who is very much an expert in advising first-time buyers. So I will leave the guest a mystery, but just to say that there will be a show next week specifically to focus on first-time buyers. Uh, I also tell you that um, I've got uh, some other live shows planned as we come up to the end of the year and starting to talk about what 2021 might look like. So hopefully that will also be um, worth pursuing. So mark your diary, 8 p.m., uh, tomorrow, uh, sorry, 8 p.m. next week, and um, it'll seem like tomorrow because the, week, the weeks just fly by. So there you go. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you next week. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off.